Are you busy? Uh, not uh, not any more than you. So it's a bit surreal that uh, everything is locked up. I mean, it's I, yeah, it I is that. It's yeah. surreal, and but also just frightening. I mean, because I think it's not that anybody actually knows what's going to happen next. Yeah, and you have, you have kids, so how are they finding? Yes. Are they uh, uh, my daughter is a little. Her crazy. Uh, she wants to be with her friends. My son, he's younger and he's more um, happy to have a parent at hand at all times, basically, etc. So he's for him, it's it's not a bad thing. But but there is a full lockdown there, so they can't go out at all. Oh no, we can go out. We can walk around. Uh, there's no restriction on walking, for example, or cycling, or okay. even driving. It's just. You're not supposed to get together with more than, I, th- I don't know, some number of people. Before I start, I've got a curiosity. Yeah, you got the you got the Nobel Prize. Were you were you expecting it, or was it just did it come out of the blue completely? Completely came out of the blue. It was not. I mean, you know, I th- I think that it's a uh, it's one of these things that you know, if you spend time worrying about it, you could obsess a lot. Yes, and. Uh, I'm reasonably good at not obsessing about things that are don't have an immediate impact on my life. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I was had no no premonition or expectation or thought about it. It was completely a, a surprise. I mean, it was a quite quite a big deal um, for us in India. We made you know you made us quite proud of. Oh, thank you, but I mean, it was, it was it's a big deal. I, I don't. I wasn't saying it's not a big deal. I just think that you know you can obsess about it, but it's not that there is a process for it that is understood by anybody. So whatever, you, anything can happen. So one of the main things I wanted to discuss with you is the impact of COVID and the lockdown and the economic devastation on our poor people and mm. how how we should be thinking about it. I mean, we've yeah. had in India a, for some time a policy framework, particularly when we were in, uh, in the UPA, of providing a sort of a, a floor for poor people, narega, uh, right to food, etc. And now a lot of that work is going to sort of fall by the wayside because we have, we have this disease coming. And uh, millions and millions of people are going to fall back into poverty. So this is something. I mean, how how should one think about this? Right. So I I think that there's these are kind of separable in in my view, in the sense that I think that the real problem in the very short run is that these um, I think more policies, good policies put in place by the UPA are inadequate. And the government, in a sense, absolutely embraced them. I mean, it was not that there was a particular partisan disagreement there. There was very clear that the UPA instruments will be used for uh, doing whatever it is. I think what is harder uh, to wrap one's head around is what do you do about the people who are not covered by that? And that's a lot of people, the migrants in particular. One of the ideas that was mooted I think in the last years of the UPA, but also embraced by the current government, was the idea that the Aadhaar would be made national and therefore would be used for PDS uh, and other things. So the Aadhaar-based uh, claims on PDS would be eligible. You would be eligible for it wherever you are. And that would have been wonderful to have that right now. We, sort of looking back, I would say that would have saved a lot of misery because I think a lot of people would have then gone to the local ration shop and said, "Here's my Aadhaar. I'm, uh, you know, I'm eligible for PDS. I'm collecting PDS in Mumbai, even though my family resides in Malda or or Darbhanga or whatever. Uh, it's it's that's uh, that's my claim. And so I think the fact that that didn't happen means that there's a bunch of people who, for whom there isn't really a system." Mm-hmm. That's my claim. And so I think the fact that that didn't happen means that there's a bunch of people who, for whom there isn't really a system. 
Mm-hmm. And the, they, they are eligible to Narega because they are in Bombay. There's no Narega in Bombay. They're not eligible for PDS because they're not actually residents. Part of the problem in this very short run is that the the conceptualization of the of the welfare structure was based on the idea that anybody who's really not in where they're supposed to be is actually uh, working and is earning an income and therefore we don't have to worry about them. And that's that's what's collapsed. And, and then the, the question of poverty, it's not obvious to me that if the economy revives, there needs to be a durable effect on poverty. The real concerns are, will the economy revive? And in particular, how does one think through the possible time parts of this disease? through that process. I think we should try to be optimistic about the survival of the overall economic well-being of the country. Uh, it just... But a lot of the, the... right actions. A lot of these people, they get their jobs from sort of small and medium businesses mm-hmm. who are going to have a sort of cash flow problem and a lot of those businesses are going to go bankrupt because of the shock. So there is, there is also a link between the economic damage that is going to come to those businessmen and the ability of these people to maintain a job. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the reason why a lot of us have been saying that we need a stimulus package. Mm-hmm. That's what the US is doing. That's what Japan is doing. That's what Europe is doing. We, are, we really haven't decided on a large enough stimulus package. We're still talking about 1% of GDP or something. Um, you know, the U.S. has gone for 10% of GDP. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, there's a sense in which I think we have to, the MSME sector, mostly the easier. We have done one thing that I think is wise, which is to, uh, to kind of put a moratorium on debt payments. I would say we could do more than that. We could, we could even... Uh, say that the debt payments for this quarter will be cancelled and you know and will be uh, taken care of by the the government uh, that you know so we could do a bit more than that so that you don't actually have to pay for a quarter where you never pay it's not just a matter of rescheduling it just per- permanently cancel it we could do that but beyond that i think the it's not clear that targeting the msme sector is the right channel. It's more reviving demand, giving money in the hands of everybody so that they go buy in the stores or they buy consumer goods. The MSME sector produces a bunch of stuff that people uh, will want. Uh, they, they've been not buying things. So if you had, they had money, or even if you promise them money, it doesn't have to be that money is right now. If you're in the red zone, you could say, look, whenever it's lifted, we'll have money in your account. We'll have 10,000 rupees in your account and you can spend it. I think spending is the easiest way to revive the economy because then the MSME people, they get money, they spend it. Uh, you know, it sort of has the usual Keynesian chain reaction. Mm-hmm. So, so we are talking about some version of Nyai or a direct cash transfer to the poorest people. Uh, absolutely, a, a direct tra- cash transfer. Uh, whether it's to the poorest people, that's that's more debatable. I, I, I would argue for a broader, because I think targeting is extremely costly. Yeah, you try to target in this in this mess. You try to target and figure out who's become poor after their their you know their shop was shut for uh, six weeks. I don't know whether, uh, how you figure this out. I wouldn't try to figure it out. I would say, you know, bottom 60% of the population, we give them some money. Uh, nothing bad will happen, in my view. That if we give them some money, well, some of them will not need it. But fine, they'll spend it. And if they spend it, that will have stimulus effects. So I, I, the only place where maybe I'm more aggressive than you are in, in that sentence is that I think I would just, I would go beyond the poorest people. So you're, you're talking for a massive priming of the pump up front. So you start up the demand as soon as possible. Yeah, I'm absolutely saying that. I've been saying that for a while, actually. Even before this happened, I've been saying that we have a demand problem. Now we have a big, going to have a bigger demand problem because it's the usual thing. I, I have no money. I'm not buying anything because I, my shop is closed. But then your shop is closed because I'm not buying anything from you. So and, I think... Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, and I think, and I think, 
implicit in what you're saying is that you need to do it faster rather than slower. So the faster you do it, the more effective it's going to be. Yeah, so it's every, going to be. Every second lost is actually damaging. You're right in saying I want it fast. I don't want to have us checking everybody's, uh, you know, lo, you know, locus standi and whether they're appropriately appropriate for this or not. I do think that it may be a miss them. We shouldn't induce a mismatch of supply and demand by giving people. Uh, you know, spending power where we have shut down the entire retail sector because they are in the red zone or something. So we need to plan that a bit better than, you know, uh, so that there's some, you get the money when you can go out and buy, not not now. Or you get a promise. You get a promise that you will get the money, so you stop panicking, you stop, stop completely, you know, starving yourself because you want to have a little bit of savings left. So if people were reassured that, you know, in two months or whenever the, 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 uh, the uh, lockdown will be lifted, they're going to have some money in their hands. I think they would be much, much less uh, worried about it. And they'll be more willing to spend already. And some of them have some savings, they'll, they'll spend it. So I, I feel that it, we shouldn't necessarily rush into it because there may be places where, you know, there's no production right now, there's no supply right now. So putting money in will just burn the money. There'll be inflation. We want to wait for that. But with that caveat, yes, soon. And, and so, so the next point is that the sooner you're able to come out of a total lockdown, the better it is. And then you need a strategy for that, that, that begins to sort of start up parts of the economy quickly. Otherwise, yes. otherwise you've got the money is useless there. Right. So I think sooner you come out of a lockdown, of course, depends very much on the on the disease. You don't want to take off the lockdown just when a lot of people are getting sick. So it's 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 absolutely that's absolutely right. We of course we have to kind of be aware of the of the time path of the disease in in that in taking that decision. The the other thing that is slightly different uh, in India is that the food issue and the scale of the food issue. Yeah. Um, so we have large numbers of people who don't have ration cards. There's, right. there's an argument being made, just, you know, uh, hand out what is in the in the godams because it's going to get more and more full as the harvest come in. So just move aggressively on that. Do you, what do you think yeah, of that? We, we wrote, uh, we in fact wrote an op-ed with Raghu Rajan and Amat Sen saying literally that, which is, hand out temporary ration cards to anybody who wants one. In fact, put all other ration cards in abeyance. Just put temporary, everybody gets, anybody wants one, again, it's a temporary ration card. Lasts for three months for now, and maybe renewed for another three months if necessary, and, you know, honor that. So everybody, give everybody a ration card. Anybody walks in, give them one, uh, you know, and and use that as the basis for for making transfers. I think we have enough stocks. We can keep going for a while. The rabi crop has been good this time, so we're going to have tons of wheat and rice. So at least wheat and rice we can keep giving out. I, I, I don't know whether we have enough dal or not, but, but I think that the government promised dal as well, and so hopefully we have enough dal and oil and cooking oil. But yes, absolutely we can. We can definitely do that and should really do that. Give give out temporary ration cards to everybody. Hmm. And and what else would you think should be on the sort of uh, the package that the government is thinking about? I mean, we've spoken about small and medium. We've spoken about migrant labor, about the food issue. What, any any other things that you feel should be on that? On that, I think the last uh, piece of this is just I think. For the people who, to get, get cash to people, we really need some machinery. We can't really get cash to people. And people who have the Jandhan accounts, they, we, they can get the money, but many people don't. And especially, um, you know, migrants may not have the access to that, etc. So I think we want to also think about what happens to the you know, substantial part of the population that doesn't have access to these things, and probably the right answer is that we should uh, we should uh, give a bunch of money available to the state governments 
to uh, try out their own schemes, to be creative in reaching people who are excluded and using NGOs. I, I think that we have to be um, willing to take some amount of, you know, mistargeting, malfeasance, some money will be stolen. But I think if we, if we sit on our hands and say that, you know, we don't want to do anything that's going to possibly go wrong, then I think we'll sure, make sure it goes wrong in a sense. There is, there is a balance between the centralization and the decentralization aspects. I mean, you, it's true that each state has its own nuances. Kerala is doing something completely different. Uttar Pradesh is doing something completely different. But then the central government also has a particular role that they have to play. And there's a tension I can see uh, between these two, these two ideas. You're completely right that this is a tension and clearly... Then the migrant movement question cannot be handled by a state government. It's a little bit odd that he's being handled so much bilaterally that, in a sense, I feel that that's, that's a problem because this is a place where you don't want to decentralize because you want to actually aggregate the information. If this is a population of people who are very infected, you don't want them to be moving through the whole country. And so I, 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 I feel that that's a place where we should have tested. Uh, people before they're allowed to board board a train or something. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so that's a central question. Yeah. Uh, that's something that a federal, only a federal government can do. Is the gov- tell the government of UP that you cannot just bring your migrants home. Uh, conversely, I think you, you the question of how to serve migrants in Bombay City is the Maharashtra government's problem and not or the Bombay City municipality's problem. And you can't have uh, you know the the federal government resolving that so I, I think that you're exactly right but I mean what what's what's your thought on that right now it seems like we are sort of in it seems like it's it's something that can't possibly be resolved in the longer run I think we need to think of you know institutions which are more robust in that way but I, right now I don't see a, what we can do about it. I mean I I feel that you have to create option value. So decentralizing uh, as much of it as possible, which they can handle at the local level, is in my view a good thing. So the, the tendency should be to sort of parcel out things that can be managed at the district level and at the state level. Of course, there are some things that, you know, uh, districts, district magistrates can't decide about airlines and about, uh, you know, about railways and stuff. So I feel that the big decisions um, should be national. And then even on the lockdown front, leeway should be given to the states. That is, if you want to lock down, you want to understand the nature of your lockdown, you please do your lockdown. So you give option value to the state and the state can say, okay, actually, I'll do this and I won't do that. And and the risk sort of comes on the state and and then they manage it better. That would be That would be how I would think about it. But I think the current government has a slightly different view. They, they prefer to sort of uh, manage and see the thing and centralize the thing. I mean, there, there are two perspectives. I don't, I don't necessarily think one is wrong and one is right. I, I, I veer towards the decentralization. I think that's what I would have done is announced a bunch of money available for proposing good schemes for reaching the poorest people and, and let states innovate. I mean, this, this, is, this is really... Uh, and I think there are good NGOs in most states who can be brought into that process and who, and as you say, the district magistrates often have great ideas and we might as well benefit from all of that. So, I, Are there uh, some experiences in other countries that uh, you found interesting? So what, I'll tell you one thing that Indonesia is doing right now. Indonesia has decided that it's going to give out, you know, cash transfers and it's going to give, give it through entirely through a community decision-making process. So the community is going to decide who are the people who are needy and, and choose them for the, for the transfers. And uh, I mean, there's, we've worked on, actually, we've on, worked with the Indonesian government on exactly this issue many years ago. And we find that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't do any worse than the centralized targeting is you don't, you don't get captured by special interests or anything. And in fact, what you get, get is, you know, 
people make judgments about what is appropriate uh, in a much more locally nuanced way. And, in India, uh, so I, I think that that's an ex- experience we could learn from. They have very much gone in the direction of using, you know, t- telling the community, here's some money, give it to the ones who are the most needy. And that's probably, uh, and in an emergency, that's a good policy for sure, I think. Because at least the community has some information that wouldn't possibly centralize. You would run into the sort of dominant caste problem, where where the dominant caste would try and sort of uh, shape that uh, that money flow. Maybe, but on the other hand, you'd worry that if you tr- in the process of trying to prevent that, I would rather put in place extra money to allow for that than to try to figure out who are the deserving people in the village. It just seems to me, I mean, I think the, the one that drives a bit in the direction of what I think you've been saying and the government has also been saying, which is let's make, try to widen the reach of PDS. Uh, and that's clearly right and make them basically quasi-universal. So that's a one way to avoid that. But if you want to do more than that to get cash to people and, you know, some people have these Jandan accounts and others don't. Some people are in the NRDJ roles. Who, that's another way to get cash to people. And some are not. Some are on the Ujwala lists and they are, some are not. Once you got through those lists, you still find that there is a bunch of people, many, many, many millions who are excluded. And how do you serve those people? And for that, it's clear that there should be some funds available to some very local authority who can identify those people and serve them. And I, I don't disagree with you that there might be elite capture of some form or the other. We worried about that a lot in Indonesia when we were working there. In fact, found not much evidence for it, to be honest. I think we'll have to sort of take a chance that some of this will go wrong. But I think we, if we don't take a chance, we'll surely get it wrong. So so be be brave, basically. Yeah. And take a few risks because we are in a bad situation. When, yeah, when you're in, a, in, in dire straits, then I think uh, being brave is the only option, really. Mm-hmm. And, and how do you see this thing playing out, you know, once the disease washes out six months from now from the poverty aspect? I mean, there's obviously well, going to be a backlash, economic backlash. There's going to be bankruptcies. How do we sort of think of it in the medium, medium term as opposed to the immediate short term? Right. So that's sort of what we were talking about a little bit before, which is, uh, you know, this question of, uh, I think, a demand shortfall. I think that's, that's the, I mean, there are two concerns. One is how to avoid a chain of bankruptcies. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe writing off a lot of debt is the way to avoid that, as you had mentioned. And the other, other one is, is uh, a demand shortfall. And getting some cash into the hands of the population is the way, the best way to kickstart the economy. The U.S. is very aggressively doing that. And this is a Republican administration run by a bunch of financiers, in fact. And they are willing to do it where we should be willing. I mean, this is not, this is not run by like a bunch of uh, socially, so, socially minded liberals. It's run by, you know, people who used to work in the financial sector. But they've decided that just for economic survival of the economy, uh, we, we need to pump money into people's hands. And that, I, I think we, we should take a cue from that. Hmm. This, is, this is also changing the sort of balance of power in the world to an extent. Uh, that, that, that is also uh, pretty clear. Yeah. How, how, how do you think about that? I think, I think they're both of them are right. I'm very worried for um, countries like France and Italy, which which didn't, which especially Italy, I think, had a fairly disastrous uh, outcome, and partly that's a result of the state being not. But I mean, the Italian state has run, been run by, you know, really, I you know, not very, uh, let's say, distinguished people for a while, and uh, it, as a result, it's it's. It sort of the health system was on the last legs when this hit. The U.S. moving much more in a nationalist direction is extremely frightening for the world. For the the rise of China being a threat, but uh, and um, if the U.S. starts reacting to it, it could be an extremely destabilizing threat. So I think that that's a 
That's something to worry about a lot.